So 2,000 years before Christ, the Mithraic religions reigned in Persia, right? Many of the allegories attributed to Jesus were merely repeated from the much older Mithraic traditions, right? There's a lot of, you can look this up too on the internet, and there's a lot of parallels between the story of Mithra and Jesus. They've changed things a little bit. Every subsequent religious generation, or I shouldn't say generation, but religious uh, martyr or deity, savior, what have you, they'll change things a little bit, right? But there's always some very core, as we know, as you know, as we know, there's always some core esoteric occulted knowledge wrapped up in there too. And we'll talk about that. So here, here's an image in the upper left-hand corner. This is uh, looks like a marble um, relief or carving of the deity Mithra. And this slaying of the bull that, that's seen here represents the age or the end of the age of Taurus, which was 4000 BC to 2000 BC. This slaying of the bull is ushering in the age of Aries, which is... 2000 BC to the birth of Christ, which of course starts the age of Pisces with Jesus. This Phrygian cap worn by Mithra is associated with liberation. This was, this is a symbol of freedom on many levels, freedom of the spirit, uh, freedom as a, as a thinker, freedom as a man, um, many levels. And we'll talk a little bit about freedom in respect to the old Persian Empire as well. So Phrygia, this is where the name comes from. Phrygia was a part of the Persian Empire located in modern Turkey. Free and educated Greeks adopted this attire of the more cultured and refined Persian Empire to the east. It's, it's always fashionable. You know, you see this with um, people in North America that want to, uh, there's, there's a lot of cachet, around um, Europe, for example. Europe is more cultured, more refined, more sophisticated. Things from Europe are more expensive. Um, there's historically the older culture, the more, um, s the, the more set or uh, established culture, the more mature culture is gonna be the more refined culture and is looked up to, right? So it's, it's no different. <clears throat> That uh, what what um, you know if if you're talking about uh, your trip to Europe, you're going to come off a little bit as a as a fancy pants, right? Um, in certain circles, and it's no different with the Greeks, and they're adopting the Persian uh, way of dress. Now, this Phrygian cap is everywhere today. I mean, to this day, the U.S. Mint uh, is making silver rounds with uh, this uh, Roman character, Roman emperor. Someone probably knows who this emperor is. I don't. With uh, the Phrygian cap. This is um, on the seal of the United States Senate. Right. This is a very old Persian symbol. Right. And many of these, uh, this is just one example of the influence, obviously. We didn't just get the red hat. We got quite a bit of our fundamental understanding of the world and our religion and philosophy and laws from this part of the world, right? So this cult of Mithra was practiced in the West. Um, it was adopted largely by Roman soldiers who, whom would meet in small groups in caves or underground structures. They did a lot of the traveling around the Roman Empire and would be the most susceptible, of course, to influence to these, um, this different uh, religion, right, from the East. In Mithraism, there, there was no central authority for this cult, right? And Mithraism was hugely popular throughout Europe and the British Isles um, in a, in a more secret way, of course, but they found over 400 different uh, Mithraic places of uh, devotion and worship uh, throughout 
the European continent and the British Isles. So this, what's different about this Eastern, this Eastern cult of Mithra though, is it was mostly decentralized. It didn't have a central authority like the Pope in the Vatican, right? And it had, it was an operational theology, which means that, you know, if you were an initiate into the cult of Mithra, you're shown some things, you're taught some things. And then at some point, when you get to a certain level, you essentially have this rough framework and then it's up to you to come in touch with your own divinity in the way that speaks to you and how you understand it. That's an operational theology. You could call that magic because if you deviate, you know, if you're a Catholic, and if you deviate too far in your practice and you go your own way, still understanding the framework that got you to the dance, right? You still understand and respect this is this is the practice that got me to the dance and I'm now going to, I understand things in my own way now. If you get a little too far out there, they're going to, they're going to light you up, right? They're going to burn you at the stake. But in the East, in the Mithraic traditions, in Zoroastrianism today, which is a religion that's active in Iran and Northern India, uh, operative theology is uh, normal. A lot of the practices of the religious Zoroastrians, the, um, or the Parsi of Northern India, this is a lot of it's done at home. There isn't a paint by numbers approach. There's a rough framework and then you find your own, you realize your own divine nature, right? You realize your own, you realize that you are God in some way. Um, at least that's the goal. That is witchcraft in the West, right? So we'll talk a lot about that uh, a little bit later. So the cult members, of course, would publicly follow the established religion of their society. So a lot of these Roman soldiers, it was Christianity, for example, right? And simultaneously, up until about the 4th century AD, the cult of Mithra was very active. And then at some point there was some um, campaign to wipe out these uh, Mithraic um, practices because Christianity had to be, you know, number one, right? So these, these Roman soldiers or these people that were practicing this Mithraic um, spiritual path, they would they would go to church on Sunday or whatever, and then they would voluntarily choose to devote themselves to the Mithraic mysteries in private. This is something they chose to do because it spoke to them in some way. It didn't tell them, you know, aside, you know, the difference with Christianity is Christianity tells you this, there's only one way to do those guys, and if you, you got to do it, or you got to do it our way, or you, or you're out, you know. But in the Mithraic sense, once you have reached a certain path, a certain level, a certain realization, then hey, if you are realizing your divine essence, really, you don't have to paint by numbers anymore. You don't have to, you don't have to follow the rules because you've you've realized your god nature. So, right, and the gods, well, they. Uh, they have a certain amount of well they have quite a bit of autonomy right not so not so much in the christian religion really not at all so this practice of the this mithraic devotion was very much a personal journey of spirituality attended to by free men so hence the phrygian cap hence the sense of liberation of the soul of of this uh, idea of realizing your own divinity really it's a very um it's a very beautiful idea and i believe it seems to me i haven't really looked into it too much but it seems to me like a lot of the esoteric orders in the west today carry this torch they carry the torch of the mithraic uh, traditions brought to the west by so many roman soldiers right So the Catholic clergyman's Zucchetto, Zucchetto, am I saying that right? Zucchetto skullcap, 
in the upper left, worn by the Pope here, the bishop's mitre in the upper right. Um, by the way, uh, the Greek word for headband or turban uh, is mitre. And the tiara, which is the headdress worn by Persian kings, a tiara is is the uh, kind of the, you could compare that to the that word to mitre in a way. Um, that's the Persian version of it. Um, or crowns worn by European kings and the Greek pylos that you see in the lower right-hand corner, all evolved from the Phrygian cap of old Persia. These are all related to this realization of one's God essence and liberation and reaching their higher self or their um, realizing their own divinity, right? As, as we shall see in the next section, part two is called um, from the um, from magi to magistrate we'll look at some of the the robes and everything and, and it's 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 quite an quite a good uh, section I had a lot of fun researching that one so the symbolic garb worn on the bodies of priests was subsequently uh, filtered down to the king at some point and his magistrates as an unmistakable symbol of spiritual authority. So remember when I said that the the law that was cast in stone, it was, or set in stone, this was understood to be the law of the divine, the law of God, right? These, um, so all of the pronouncements from the Magi of Europe, the, the, you know, I would say the, the priests, the, the bishops, the Vatican, and the Pope, and everything. These were the, the Western version of the Magi, where they would say these are the laws, and they were the ones who sanctioned the king. They said, you know, we're okay with this king, you know, because it all came from God. So we'll talk about that. That all comes from this idea that um, comes down to us from Persia, right? But then there's some sort of flip. We'll talk about the flip and why there's a big difference between the Western um, view on God and the Eastern view. But first, we'll talk about Mithra a little bit more. So the androgynous deity Mithra is commonly depicted with the rays of the sun coming from a halo around his or her head. By the way, Mitra in Iran is a female name, um, which comes from Mithra, of course. Mithra is not an anthropomorphism of the sun, though. Mithra represents a mediator or unity of opposites between sun and moon, day and night, masculine and feminine. That's why Mithra has this androgynous nature, this sort of masculine and feminine. It isn't, it has nothing to do with some sort of gender confusion. It's incorporating or it's including the sacred masculine and divine feminine energies. It's its reconciling those within yourself, right? And I talk a lot about that on my previous uh, presentations on Silent Hill. So this, this concept is very old, and it's very foundational in occult and esoteric studies, right? So I'm sure most of you are very familiar with this. So we're seeing this unity of opposites express, expressed in these figures here. These, these are all uh, figures that come from the archetype of Mithra, or the, another way to put it is the Persian, the old Persian, um, the old Persian anthropomorphism of masculine and feminine. Or the, not even that, that's not even a good way to put it. The old Persian view of reconciling male and female, masculine and feminine. So this Persian Mithra archetype is found in the Colossus of Rhodes, which of course this is a recreation in the lower left. It's that, that statue is long gone. Um, and of course the Statue of Liberty is the same Mithra archetype. I mean, right at our doorstep in New York City, we have this giant old Persian religious symbol, 
just right there and hardly anyone knows it right by the way this symbol of the eternal flame is is very important even to this day in the Zoroastrian religion the symbol of the eternal flame is a sacred concept in the Zoroastrian faith which reformed and absorb the older practices of Mithraism into its own religion that still survives today in Iran and India. In Persia and India today, and when I say Persia, of course I mean Iran, I mean that region of Iran, there are fire temples to this very day where the same flame is burned for thousands of years. I don't know if this is true, but I, I've heard of a couple of fire temples uh, maybe one in India, one in Persia that have had, you know, take it for what it's worth, the same flame burning for 4,000 years. Um, I don't know. If I, have, I haven't been around long enough to verify that. <laughs> uh, I guess you could just have to take their word for it because no one can. These flames have been tended to by devout Zoroastrians for thousands of years, apparently. Monuments of the eternal flame exist all around the world today as a direct result of this, including the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier in Paris and the memorial dedicated to John F. Kennedy. And I believe that Jackie Kennedy at the time had visited India, and after she had got back from India, then she came up with this idea probably have seen having have she i'm guessing she saw some sort of fire temple over there possibly maybe but don't quote me on that all such monuments that we see here represent mithra as a symbol of liberation of mankind as a free and divine being in zoroastrianism the four elements are very sacred they have ceremonies designed around the four elements and fire is um, one of those that's the most sacred. So it's well known that the culture and religious tolerance of the Persian Achaemenid Empire allowed it to flourish and spread westward to Greece. It was, it was the empire that influenced the Greeks who looked to the east and thought, hmm, you know, Shoot, we could do something like that. We could do that, right? It was Cyrus the Great, the first ruler of the Achaemenid Empire, a Zoroastrian himself who conquered Babylon, and he set the Israelites free. Now, remember, this is an old Persian. This, this is a ruler from old Persia. The Israelites, and we're supposed to think of the Persians and the Jews or Iran and Israel, right? As being just mortal enemies to the end, right? That's what we're led to believe. The Israelites were allowed to return after Cyrus the Great's conquering of Babylon. The, um, the Jews were prisoners. They were slaves in Babylon. And here comes King Cyrus, Cyrus the Great, and he frees them. He even finance, finances the rebuilding of the Hebrew temple, right? Like, okay. Cyrus the Elder, as he is known by the Greeks, is the only Gentile, the only non-Jew to be referred to as a Mashiach in the Hebrew Bible, a Messiah, right? You've got to think, why would a Persian of all people be named as a messiah in the hebrew bible right that's how highly regarded cyrus the great was right there's a long history there we won't go into that but the point is there is a long history of an exchange of knowledge and wisdom very deep esoteric and occulted knowledge and wisdom that's shared between the Hebrews and the Magi. Here's a quote from Will Durant. He's a very well-known American historian and philosopher, and he's talking about the Achaemenid Empire. He said, Then for the first time in known history, 
an empire almost as extensive as the United States received an orderly government, a competence of administration, a web of swift communications, a security of movement by men and goods on majestic roads, equaled before our time only by the zenith of imperial Rome. Right? There's no doubt that the Greco-Roman Empire, the Roman Empire, the, the civilization of Greece and Rome was heavily influenced by the Persian Achaemenid Empire, their laws, their philosophy, the religious ideas, the magic, right? There's no doubt that magic, a lot of magic came to the West through Egypt. I used to think, now I realize that was wrong, but I used to think that pretty much all of our magic came from Egypt. All, when we're talking about esotericism and ancient wisdom, all roads lead to Egypt. But now I realize I was completely wrong, right? Egypt has its own, its very own flavor of magic, its own taking nothing away from Egypt. It has its own esoteric orders, right? There was a lot of sharing between all of these uh, ancient religions of peace, these religions that any religion that was based on this love of wisdom and knowledge would share with other like-minded faiths and esoteric orders and mystery traditions, right? It makes perfect sense. It's only the religions of conquest that want to shut everyone else out. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in future parts of this presentation. <laughs> so don't worry. And in case you were wondering, yes, the founder of the Mazda car company, and I didn't reveal the name of the of the Zoroastrian deity yet, did I? That Zoroastrian deity, um, God, you could say, is Ahura Mazda in the Zoroastrian faith. The founder of the Mazda Car Company wanted his enterprise to be named after a divine force. It also helped that Mr. Matsuda's last name was similar to the Persian deity of light, Ahura Mazda. <laughs> so if you're driving a Mazda, um, extra, extra occult points for you. Good job. The logos of the Mazda car company represent the Fravashi, or the winged figure. This, this winged figure on the left, in the lower left we see here, this is essentially a, I'm not a Zoroastrian, so um, maybe one of you guys are, but to my understanding, the Fravashi represents man realizing his divine nature at the end of the history of the cosmos, right? The most enlightened light being a man realizing or human, the human realization of their own divinity. And this, he appears to be an angel to me, this Fravashi uh, figure it appears to be some sort of an angel, but this is essentially what that represents. And of course, the eternal flame is also um, something that has been used in the Mazda car logos. As you can see, there's a couple of versions, a couple of variations on the Fravashi and uh, two very clear depictions of the eternal flame. And of course, the the Mazda logo that's been around since 97 is, is very recognizable. So <laughs> every time I see a Mazda now, I'm, I'm just never the same. So the role of the magistrate in Rome came directly from its imperial big brother to the east. Persian influence in Greco-Roman culture was widespread, especially for the noble classes, like we talked about a little bit earlier. Had it not been for the influences of the Persian Magi, many historians doubt Greece and Rome could have ever organized empires on such a scale at all. Someone had to set the archetype, right? This... These things don't magically just come up. And having said that, the archetype had to have been set 
for Persia, right? For the Ecumenid Empire at some point. Um, that those, whatever that is, whatever those civilizations are, uh, maybe they're largely lost uh, and grinded under by the thousands of years of history and earth change. Who knows? I mean, there is Gobekli Tepe, which is supposed to be 12,000 uh, as a huge city that was intentionally buried and rediscovered in 1995 that is, uh, some estimate, 12,000 to 15,000 years old. Um, maybe that is the next step. I don't know. But anyway, the mystic and religious traditions of Western civilization were largely derived from the south central regions of Asia and of, of modern Iran and India. Okay. That's the point that I'm making here is that we can trace back, as far as we can trace back, our, under, uh, not our understanding, but magic came to us through the religious traditions. Because one thing that isn't really widely understood is the religions in South Central Asia, such as the Parsi, the Zoroastrians, um, and a lot of different um, religions of India, for example. Um, but it's especially true with the Zoroastrians. There's no difference to them between magic and religion, right? And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So that is, um, in a future uh, part, we'll talk about that. So the magical elements and language we use today still contain the breath of life from the Magi and the mystics of the East. And I'll continue to show this as um, subsequent parts are released on my channel. In the next part of this presentation, we're going to explore the influence of the Magi into the magistrate of European feudal society and trace it to our modern day judicial system. Okay. So that is going to come up soon. This is the end of part one. And I did want to spend a minute to, this is, um, this is a fresco of a Mithraic, um, this, this was found, I'm not sure which, exactly which site, but this was found in a European uh, Mithraic <clears throat> temple. And this fresco is, um, it's amazing actually. It, it, it shows us quite a few things here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do my best. I mean, I'm not an expert at all in Mithraism, but what little I know um, about it, I'll, I'll do my best to try to talk a little bit about this, just to give you a little, little extra if you're interested. So the first thing, the first thing to, to look at what stands out right away is we can see that um, we have this Mithra character and he's got this cape and this cape has the stars inside of it, right? So this is an indication that what we're looking at is some sort of constellation, right? There's a, const there's a set of constellations in the sky that is known as the Wheel of Mithra, or Wheel of Mithras. And it has these different uh, figures. It, it's, it's comprised of the bull. Um, you can see that in the upper left, there's a crow near the uh, top of the cape of Mithra. Um, down below, near the, the bull's testicles, you can't really see it, it's pretty faded, but there's a scorpion down there. Um, clamping down on the bull's testicles. There's a, uh, of course, there's the knife wound that Mithra is plunging a dagger into the, the, uh, the gorge of the bull. And there's a snake here lapping up the blood, and there's also a, a dog who's snacking on the blood. And these are all, these all represent, to my understanding, these all represent, along with Taurus, 
this wheel of Mithra. Now this wheel of Mithra is in more more or less a shape of um, you see this common you would see this commonly in India the shape of a swastika, and this swastika um, I remember the first time I saw a swastika on uh, I was I was twenty uh, something and I was I think I was in London and I saw a uh, an Indian woman, I'd never seen this before. I saw, I've seen Indian women before, obviously, but I saw this Indian woman with a purse and she had a swastika on it. And I thought, what's going on here? And I learned that um, this has to do with the cycle of life, the four elements, the, you know, there's a lot of analogs, there's a lot of comparisons with this, this swastika, which of course was defiled by the Third Reich. They are taking this, um, mysticism and kind of twisting it and using it in their own way, of course. But this wheel of Mithra is actually the swastika. It's a very old and sacred uh, symbol that you'll find commonly in India. Um, I suppose you might find it in Persia. I'm not sure, but the there has to be a, a fair amount of overlap between the esoteric uh, traditions of India and. Persia, right? So you can see. Um, let's let's look at look at the upper left hand corner. You can see what appears to be Mithra again with this halo behind him, right? This halo is a very old Persian idea. Might be even probably older than that. But this represents the sun. And then over to the right in the upper right column, it's kind of scratched out, but there's a darker uh, character. And that represents the the night. And you could obviously you could extrapolate masculine and feminine from that day and night, right? This is also mirrored by those two smaller uh, characters, those two small men standing on either side of these columns. The one on the left, underneath, standing underneath the sun, right? He's holding a torch upright, right? This is symbolic of the day. And the person on the right is holding the torch down to the ground, which is symbolic of the night. You could also say uh, one is life and the other is death, right? There's this unity of opposites that goes on seemingly just forever, right? So the other the other thing I wanted to point out, um, the left side of this fresco is actually lighter overall than the right side if you really look at it. And that again is showing us this light and dark contrast, this masculine and feminine. So that's part of the overall image. By the way, that's something that you find in the um, Last Supper. The Last Supper has that too. It's the Last Supper, I'll have to look at it again and compare it. I might do a comparison video with this uh, Mithraic image because they're are quite a few uh, parallels that I'm starting to uh, to notice, but the Last Supper has this dark and light uh, motif with it too. It's very interesting. The masculine, and feminine. Now you'll also notice on the left and right pillars or columns, there's four tiles on each side. Okay, these are the steps of the initiate into. Um, attaining the higher self or reaching or realizing the your realizing liberation and that liberation is realized once you have come into your own divinity or realized your own divine nature right maybe there's a loose association with the seven steps of alchemy actually there's eight steps right um the eighth is the is the uh, octave is the harmony is the it's like music right but there are these four um, panels on each side totaling eight and each of these represents a step so you could almost say that maybe there's some probably is I'm thinking I haven't really looked into it but I'm thinking there's probably some sort of some sort of connection between alchemy the seven or eight steps of alchemy and th 
this old Mithraic idea of um, ascension into realizing your divinity. So that's um, that's what I understand about this Mithraic uh, image. I'm sure there's quite a bit more to this that I'm just not seeing or I'm just barely scratching the surface. But um, I've been looking at this one for quite a while. Um, and uh, it's, it's really interesting. I just, yeah, I'd love to go to one of these temples sometime and see that. So this is the end of part one. The next series, um, or I should say the next episode of this Word Magic series is going to be called From Magi to Magistrate. And that one is, um, I had a lot of fun researching that one and I had quite a few aha moments. So um, I'm going to end it here. Thanks for watching this one and I'll see you on the next one. Thanks.